Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. That is from Zechariah 9. And I love it because it's telling this chunk of a story that is just unfolding over time for us. But God is outside of time. He's eternal. He doesn't have a beginning or an end. He's just forever true. He's just forever who he is. And he reveals himself to us through time, like, you know, through humans. And and um, and then he revealed himself even further through the prophetic writings, it says in the end of Romans, through his son, through the proclamation of Jesus Messiah. And it's how we can n understand and know God better. And of course, there's more revealings that will happen. So we're stuck in this little moment of time for us, but God is outside of it. And uh, so when he tells stories or there's things in the Bible, it's like to him, he just sees the whole picture, you know. And for us, it's like, oh, here's a donkey, or here's a this, but then there, this hasn't happened yet. Or, you know, there's all this confusion sometimes. But um, I just love that about God that he just, you know— like he's just outside of it all and he can talk about in Zechariah uh the blood of his covenant before Jesus even shed his blood for us and established that covenant of peace to take away our sins. Hmm. That's good. Well, uh welcome to Standing in Faith by the way. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> My name is Kat and I'm in the studio as always with Jeff. Here I am. And David. Hi. So the subject today is the attribute of God as infinite and eternal. And um, I did some poking around as I normally do, trying to get ready to do one of these episodes. And um, th this is a particular characteristic or name of God um, the first time that I was able to find it was in Genesis 21, 33. Um, this is where Abraham was planting a teramisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, um, which immediately made me think of that song. I'm not going to remember the lyrics. You are the everlasting God. Um, so... I, I got curious and wanted to know more about what that word meant, and it's actually kind of a really cool word. Um, I, am not, I am not a Hebrew scholar. <laughs> I think it's pronounced olam, and um, it means long duration, antiquity, futurity, forever and ever, everlasting, evermore, perpetual, and I'll stop there. I liked that word perpetual. Right? We think of, you know, perpetual motion and mm -hmm. things, but mm -hmm. perpetual means that it's it's always. It's always. Um, which, by the way, is also one of the possible translations for the word um, always. Um, so anyhow, I, I thought that was kind of interesting. It actually appears over 439 times scripturally. Hmm. Uh, and it's usually in the form of the word that we're familiar with, ever, uh, everlasting. Everlasting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when we first were talking about this, I, that old song came back to my mind, Ancient of Days. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to sing it a lot. Mm -hmm. True. Ancient so, of Days. Yeah, oh, Ancient of Days. 
And um, it's so funny because it, 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 every time I'd say ancient, I'd think of this God sitting on a throne with this long white beard, you know, like he's <laughs> ancient. <laughs> yep. You know, and, and it, it, it's, God doesn't grow old, you know, like we think, because we think in time. Mm-hmm. It, it's hard for us to conceive that, that God uh, doesn't, doesn't live, even though he, he looks into, sees before, sees the middle, sees after everything, and though he walks with us in time, you know, through the Holy Spirit, yet at the same time, he doesn't live in, he's not subjected to time. He's not affected by time like we are affected by it. And um, uh, so God is eternally always the same. That's why it says he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, because God doesn't grow and mature. And, you know, there's a, a crazy theology out there. It's called process theology that says God is in process. It says that he hasn't gotten it together yet. Basically, basically that's what it's saying, Oof. that he's oh, still is, growing into it. You is that know? that philosophy where it means you can sin now because God uh, matured enough that now you can have your sin and God won't be against it? Well, <laughs> that, you could easily put that into it. it. It's interesting that the whole idea of process theology, you know, is real heavily appreciated by people in the counseling field um you know because they can bend things kind of like what you're talking about but that god is in process god is still creating and and figuring things out well that that's ridiculous that's it actually the opposite of what cat started off with. exactly yeah the cat started off with the fact that he he knew all of his covenants before they even were covenanted, mm-hmm. right? And he's withhold he's not withholding, but he's 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 obliging himself to maintain those covenants, right, and fulfill them. Mm-hmm. So that wouldn't be an in process thing. That would have to have been a foreknown, predestined thing. Well, <laughs> and I said the naughty word, predestined. Yeah, but it goes back into the idea. When, when, you, when you create a theology like that, what you're doing is you're creating God in your own image. Yes. You're creating an image of God that you want him to look like. Oh, uh, that's idolatry then. Well, of course it is. But at the same time, it's... it's it, it, Thou it, shalt not. It's, it's rewriting. It's rewriting what God, you know, <laughs> you, re- you said that the, the Hebrew word is everlasting God. Mm-hmm. Um, with no beginning, with no end, you know, lives outside of time, et cetera. And yet what, what that kind of theology does is brings him into time and creates this kind of a God who's, you know, working with things, figuring things out, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's trying to bring God down to our level so we can figure him out and make him into what we like. Yeah as opposed to who God really is, sovereign, powerful, almighty, all the kinds of different names that we've talked about so far, mm. um, uh, and eternal, not living in time and space. Even God's name, the very root name of God that was not allowed to be pronounced or whatever. I mean, even, of course, even when he, he, he talked to Moses, he, he said, who are you? He says, I am that I am. That word basically means that God bees. That he, he, he doesn't he, he didn't exist before. He doesn't exist afterwards. He bees. He it's present is present tense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For him to be on time it is present tense everywhere. Always. 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 Where's that there's that word again. Always. Yeah, yeah. Always. So he yeah. he's he's <laughs> and you know, that's why it gets so difficult for us because, you know, we have never known anything else but time. Get up in the morning, go to do do this, every schedule or whatever, you know, in, in your life, eat, drink, be merry, whatever it may be mm. um, that you do, you know, it's based on time and your lifespan, you know. Now, we who believe like the eternal blood of the covenant that you read, who believe in that kind of thing, we understand everlasting life. But do we really understand it? Not really. We understand it, that we're going to continue to live on. 
but not in these physical bodies that are subjected to time that deteriorate and go away. So there's an interesting idea we can talk about for a little bit. So if if God is eternal, and that means he's present tense always, and that we've been created new, right? Reborn. Mm -hmm. We are a new creation, right? We now also, in effect, spiritually become immortal, Mm -hmm. right? Meaning we're eternal. Then present tense us is part of eternity. Yes. So we're already living, existing in eternity. Yeah, exactly. Right now. Yeah. Well, that's what he says, I give you eternal life. Well, if he comes to live in us, he's eternal. Mm -hmm. And if his spirit becomes one spirit with our spirit, Mm -hmm. that's eternal. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so so it's interesting because, you know, I think even Paul in his writings was, was, was trying to always get us to think in that context, to think in the, in the sense of eternal. Um, and yet the time is short. Yeah, time is short. The time is short for what? For whatever it is. You know, they were always saying that the time is short. Um, uh, there's a great harvest. We you know all of those kinds of things that need to take place. But at the, at the same time, <laughs> is that word, mm-hmm. uh, uh, there's a sense of us of thinking in an eternal context of, like I said, Sunday, not trying to get heaven, us to heaven, but heaven in us now, that eternal aspect now, so that we begin to walk that out now and look like Jesus now. Mm-hmm. When I get tempted sometimes to uh, feel like I want things to go my way and not necessarily just like, you know, in my little life, but just in the world, you know, I just want people to be obedient to Jesus now. I want everybody to just like be at peace now. I want all the, you know, the swords beaten into plowshares now, you know, like mm-hmm. um, I try to keep in mind the idea of if I was taking my kids like in they were little, you know, back when they were little, like we're on our way to somewhere really great and say it's like a 15 minute ride. But on the way, they're arguing and, you know, imagine them arguing and jostling and, well, I want to sit in the front or I want this or I want this snack or, you know, just like all the little drama that would go on. And I'm like, guys, this car ride doesn't matter. Like we're about to go to an amusement park or whatever. This car ride, once you at the amusement park, you're not even going to remember the car ride. Like, who cares who has the crackers or who sits in the front? Or, you know, it's like, don't worry. When we get there, you're going to forget all about this. It's not even going to be worth comparing, you know? That's and uh, good. I yeah. just try to keep that in my mind when I feel that impatience or, mm-hmm. you know, or even just feel that it feels selfishness, even for just not even something like lofty, like world peace or something. But, you know, just like I want to do it this way or whatever. There, there's a song that I don't know. I, I love this song. How great is our God? Um, but there's some there's some verses in it. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands. The beginning and the end. The beginning and the end. Um, I I really I think that that fits this idea right now that we're talking about of him being infinite and eternal Um, because we've been talking a little bit about time, but there are some examples, scriptural examples of where God was clearly in control of time. Um, And the one that jumps out at me the most is, is with Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. I, I think that was Second Kings chapter 20. All right, Hezekiah was sick. This is in chapter 20. I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit. He was sick and he was about to die. So Isaiah comes to him and this is what Isaiah says. This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you're going to die. You will not recover. So he leaves, uh, Isaiah leaves, and uh, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. 
Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back, tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. I have heard your prayer and I've seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah tells him what to do uh, to get him better. And Hezekiah asked Isaiah, well, what's going to be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I'll go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now? Isaiah answered, this is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. Shall the shadow go back, go forward 10 steps or shall it go back 10 steps? And so Hezekiah replies, it's a simple matter for the shadow to go forward 10 steps, rather have it go back 10 steps. Then the prophet Isaiah called upon the Lord and the Lord made the shadow go back the 10 steps it had gone down the stairway of Ahaz. Okay, so that, that, that's measuring the sun shadow. Can you imagine? I, I was just sitting there as you were l talking through that. The, the first part is, right, Isaiah gets a really short little word from the Lord that essentially go tell King Hezekiah, he's going to die in three days, bye. That, that's pretty much what he did. He, I, I got a word from the Lord, you're going to die in three days. <laughs> and then he turns and walks out. Um. How many of us would receive a word from the Lord like that and think it wasn't, it wasn't God, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, oh, it did come, it back did to come the pit from of hell, <laughs> Satan, right? Uh, okay. I would just think I got to get my office straightened out because Sheila's not going to know what in the world to do. If I'm going <laughs> <to> do. <laughs> hey. Um, I really like that section where God says, "Hey, look, I heard your prayers. I saw your tears." Um, I'm going to heal you. I, that's that's valuable to me now. So by moving time back, right, that means that at least I'm not a physicist and I'm certainly not a quantum physicist and I really don't can't say that I completely understand time. So I'm completely out of my league with what I'm going to say next. But to me, that means that there, there's something that happened that extended the day mm -hmm. by, who knows, minutes, they, hours. They say 10 minutes, that 10 steps would have been like 10, 10 minutes, minutes, something like that, or half hour, I guess. I, I don't know. I, yeah. I have no idea, but it, it extended the day, right? Yeah. He, he, can, he can control time to the point where he either stopped the earth from spinning, which means... There wasn't gravity anymore, I guess, and we all would have flown <laughs> up in the air. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I don't think happened because the Bible didn't say everything started to fly away. Yeah. Right? So that one check, nope, not that's not possible. Or the sun was repositioned. Okay, that can you imagine that moving the sun? <laughs> that probably didn't happen. I don't know, right? I know. Or, or the entire universe shifted. Without what, a millimeter. Yeah, without uh, everything just like exploding and falling well, apart, and uh, this all just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. yeah, but look at the one where he does it for a day. There's another instance where they're having the fight, the battle, and he he extends the extends time further. Extends the time yeah. for well, Joshua. Yeah, and Joshua. There's a story about this. Well, if you, have you got that scripture, uh, Kat? Um. If you do, there's a, a, a neat story about this when, when at, down in Nassau, when they were doing uh, traveling and stuff, and they found that there was a glitch in time. Oh, I know this story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it just so happened there was this pastor there who knew the scriptures, uh -huh. and, the, and he went back and took that, the one we read of Hezekiah, and the one with Joshua, and he gave them the exact glitch that they had in time. The was, durations of those two, oh, events, those two events. Then they added it all uh -huh. up and they, and it matched and it, and it perfectly. Matched. Yes, yeah. yes. I heard that yeah, story. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the story you just mentioned is in Joshua 10. And um, the uh, 
they're you know they're they are in the promised land and they're you know they're doing their campaigns they're warring against the people and it's really God doing it but you know they're kind of joining in um, and the people of Gibeon remember the Gibeon people they had made um, that that kind of like treaty they faked that they were like from some faraway mm-hmm, place mm-hmm. and they made that treaty they had like the raggy clothes and moldy bread um, just look that up if you guys don't know what we're talking about with that it's an interesting story in itself. Anyway, all right, so this king of Jerusalem, who at this point, Jerusalem was not in the hands of the Israelites, um, had heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and were living near them. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, and these other kings with the names, it's hard to read. And he said, come up and help me attack Gibeon, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. So then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jamath, Lashish, Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. So the Gibeons sent word to Joshua and was like, hey, you made a treaty with us. Come on. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them at the great victory of Gibeon. And so Israel pursues them all the way, and the Lord throws down hailstones and all this stuff. Um, And on that day, the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel. Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself and its enemies. The sun stopped In the middle of the sky, delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Okay, so that's even greater than, what, 10 or 15 steps, right? Yeah. That's an entire day. So, yeah, it's hard for me as I'm sitting there listening to you. I'm like, all right, so they marched all day. They, they marched all night. All day, yeah, they marched, marched all, all night, night, fought, fought all, day, all day, and then, and then he extended, extended it for another 24 or 12 yeah. to 24 hours, and they kept fighting. Yeah. So that's at least 36 or 48 hours of no sleep. Yeah. Yeah, they were still going. They're still going, and they yeah. won. Yeah. So that, that's absolutely mind-bending mm-hmm. for me. I just I can't wrap my hands around or head around that, but that's that's okay, right? That, to me— is where we start to get into just the the majesty, the awesomeness, the awe of it, the yeah, the splendor of our king. Clothed in majesty. Here I go quoting that song again. Yeah. And Deuteronomy thirty three twenty six, I like this. It says there's no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides the heavens to help you, and in his excellency on the clouds, the eternal God is is your refuge. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I mean, that visual, that picture of of God, not only uh, is he... He's eternal, but he's he's very much present mm-hmm. with us. You know, he he doesn't live in time; he lives outside of time. But he's very much present with us, always present with us, never to leave or to forsake us. You know, and of course, you may be going through something very difficult, uh, situations where you you wonder. Where are the everlasting arms, you know? Where is yeah. mm. where is the God of, of Jeshurun, as it said in there? And and yet he he is ever, ever, ever present. He's there. He 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 grieves with us. He lives through pain with us. Sometimes you ask, Well, why don't you just take it away? Well, 
those are probably some of the mysteries that one day we can ask God. But for the present, you know, he, we have to embrace the comfort that God's got it. God knows what he's doing. He's got this. He's got this. He's, he's got it. Um, and maybe that's easy to say right now because I'm, you know, I feel pretty good and it's a nice day and so forth. Yeah. <laughs> maybe by the end of the day I, I, I would, you know, be— Somebody will cut you off in traffic yeah, and then you'll be grouchy. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, something like that. But, uh, it, yeah, now, I, of course, now I've come to grips with the fact if somebody cuts me off in traffic is God planned it that way. So. <laughs> See if I, see if I'm receiving his patience or not yet. <laughs> but anyway, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I think if I was like taking my kids when they were little to an amusement park and uh, they were like each wanted to have a turn riding in the car on the way in the front seat, I would not stop the car, you know, and divide the time up and let them. You know, I'd just be like, no, like let's just go. Mm-hmm. One is sitting in the front, and we're we're going. Let's bless the listeners. God, thank you for providing redemption for us. Thank you for your everlasting covenant that you have paid for with your blood. We bless the listeners with transformation in their mind and in their hearts to remember your covenant that you've made with us and remember your steadfast love. Father, thank you that time is in your hands. Thank you that you you are the beginning and the end. You are the antiquity and the futurity that none of this is catching you off guard, that this is all part of your, not just your plan, but your love for each and every one of us. Wrap those everlasting arms around each of us. Lord, in Jesus' name, I bless the listeners, with a revelation and an understanding of just even a a small ray even of the beauty of your eternal existence and that you are eternally always with us in everything and wherever we are. And an understanding, Lord, of of time in that we live in now. You said in Ecclesiastes, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stone, a time to gather stones, time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Give us grace to grasp that, Lord, in the midst of the times that we live in, and yet understand and honor that you are sovereign, powerful, and mighty. Amen. Amen.